comparatively few people today believe in the biblical account of creation found in Genesis. Adam and Eve in particular are given, at best, mythological status. This unbelief, sad to say, is also found among the clergy and laity of the post-Vatican II religion. All of this notwithstanding, the existence of, an Adam, of Adam and Eve is a dogma of the Catholic faith. The fall had tremendous consequences for the entire human race. Indeed, every one of us is afflicted with original sin, as well as the curse God placed upon Adam and Eve. I'm Julius Smetona. This is what Catholics believe. Today we're going to review and discuss the biblical account of creation, original sin, and Adam and Eve. With me are Father Thomas Marachka, pastor of St. Anne Church in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, a suburb of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, and Father William Jenkins, pastor of St. Teresa the Child Jesus Church in Parma, Ohio. Fathers, uh, many younger, namely, say, under 40 uh, years of age, Catholics may not be aware of this, but uh, one cannot say, for instance, I am a Catholic, and at the same time, I don't believe in Adam and Eve. It's a contradiction. Uh, what is the basis for Catholic belief in Adam and Eve, Father Jenkins? Well, it's divine revelation that uh, God created a garden, uh, and in that garden, he uh, fashioned the first man and the first woman. Um, he gave them a body suitable for an immortal soul <clears throat> which was created in God's own image and likeness. He created them capable of knowing truth and loving goodness and in that sense being in the image of God. It was also, is there a, a physical location where this garden actually was? Is there indication, any indication? Well, Sacred of Scripture tells us that it was uh, at the fountainhead of four rivers, uh, Fison, Gaon, the Tigris, and the Euphrates. We can still find the Tigris and the Euphrates on the maps of uh, the Near East. Um, but we don't know exactly where the spot was, because the spot was uh, obliterated, at least from the eyes of men, when Adam and Eve fell. It might be helpful here to read the, the words of sacred scripture with regard to the creation of Adam and Eve. This is found in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, beginning at verse 26. And God made the beasts, 25, excuse me, and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and cattle and everything that creepeth on the earth after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And he said, let us make man to our image and likeness and let him have dominion over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and the beasts and the whole earth and every creeping creature that moveth upon the earth. And God created man to his own image. To the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, saying, Increase and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the air and all living creatures that move upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed upon the earth, and all trees that have in themselves seed of their own kind to be your meat. And to all the beasts of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to all that move upon the earth, and wherein there is life, that they may have to feed upon, and it was so done. And God saw all the things that he had made, and they were very good, and the evening and morning were the sixth day. And then if we move on into the second chapter of Genesis, we come to uh, verse 15. And it says, And the Lord God took man and put him into the paradise of pleasure to dress it and keep it. And he commanded him, saying, Of every tree of paradise thou shalt eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in what day soever thou shalt eat of it, thou shalt die the death. No. And uh, so this not only gives us the account of the creation of Adam and Eve and God's first command to mankind to increase, multiply, and fill the earth, but also it gives us the, uh, the context of the, of the test that God gave before any creature of God could see him. 
in the beatific vision, that creature had to first humble himself by an act of obedience. And this act of obedience had to do with man uh, controlling his appetite and his pride and submitting that this one, this one tree, the fruit of this one tree, would not be accessible to him. Father Marachka, if I just may ask you this, uh, what were some of the, uh, what were Adam and Eve like before the fall? Well, Jul Julius, uh, there's an account also in the Holy Scripture in the third chapter of Genesis. God placed our first parents, Adam and Eve, in a beautiful place, the Garden of Paradise. And in this garden, he gave our first parents everything. There are many, many trees mentioned in the Garden of Paradise. There are two in particular, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of divine life. And God said to our first parents, all of this will, is yours. You can enjoy yourselves. The only thing I ask of you is don't eat the fruit in the middle of the garden of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In fact, if we read the account, we can read the account in the third chapter of Genesis of original sin. The third chapter of Genesis says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the earth which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Why hath God commanded you that you should not eat of every tree of paradise? And the woman answered him, saying, of the fruit of the trees that are in paradise, we do eat. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of paradise, God hath commanded us that we should not eat and that we should not touch it, lest perhaps we die. And the serpent said to the woman, No, you shall not die to death, for God doth know that in what day soever you shall eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And the woman saw that the tree was good to eat, and fair to the eyes, delightful to behold. And she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave her husband who did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened, and when they perceived themselves to be naked, they sewed together fig leaves, and made themselves aprons. Here we have uh, the account in Holy Scripture of what happened to our first parents. God created Adam and Eve of what we call in the state of original justice. And he gave our first parents certain gifts, uh, beautiful gifts, the most important of which is the supernatural gift of sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace from the catechism is that grace which makes the soul holy and pleasing in God's eyes. He also gave our first parents what we call preternatural gifts. These are gifts uh, given to a particular creature which he has no right or title or claim to, but may be given to a higher creature, such as, for example... Uh, what were these preternatural well, gifts? Well, the preternatural gifts mainly, some affected the mind, one, one in particular uh, affected the mind of our first parents. And that was the preternatural gift of enlightenment. Uh, God gave our first parents, Adam and Eve, a certain knowledge. Uh, he gave them a certain knowledge of the moral and religious truths that they could instruct their children, uh, a knowledge of the secular sciences. He also gave them the preternatural gift of uh, integrity, where man would have control over his lower nature, his, his animal appetites control over uh, the lust of the flesh, where the body would be, the flesh would be uh, subject to the dictates of right reason. The will of man would be obedient to the will of God. If I may interrupt you, Father, this is actually affirmed in sacred scripture. Before it said they were ashamed when they were naked. Yes. Before that, they yeah. said they were naked and they were not right. ashamed. <clears throat> right. Yes. This, you know, uh, also, also, the third gift, before you forget, uh, the gift uh, of immortality. Uh, we have enlightenment, we have immortality, and we have integrity. Immortality means that they would not suffer the death. They would not... Or illness. Or illness or physical disease. And uh, they would not grow old or physically die. <coughs> the gift of infused knowledge was necessary for them because God created them in the state of 
uh, the fullness of, of life. Uh, he didn't create them in childhood or in adolescence. He created, created them in adulthood. And so they needed to be uh, endowed with the knowledge of living in the world. And uh, God infused this knowledge in them. He also infused in them a certain knowledge of certain uh, supernatural truths. And uh, he gave them as well, as Father says, integrity of nature, which was the fact that their lower passions could not overwhelm uh, the higher faculties of the soul. For example, um, we are subject to the passions of anger and lust and, uh, and so on. You know, all of the other emotions that we can experience, it can be very overwhelming at times. But Adam and Eve did not experience this because their wills had control over these lower passions. Uh, they had the gift of immortality. They had the gift of impassibility, too. They could not suffer, suffer illness or injury. Uh, these were preternatural gifts insofar as they were not altogether uh, exceeding uh, human nature, but they were not due to human nature. We know that these gifts were given to Adam and Eve because after they fell, God addressed Adam and Eve and told them what the consequences of their betrayal would be. The curse of Adam. And right. that curse was that he would then have to suffer, they would have to suffer, they would have to work, and they would eventually have to die. And they'd have to bring forth children in suffering. Right. right. And that, that would not have been the case. In other words, if that were the punishment that they would endure for having sinned, obviously they would not have had to have done that before they sinned. Were there any other th preternatural <coughs> gifts, or they were three in number? Those are basically the three. So they, if we would have met Adam and Eve in their original state, we would have looked upon them as perhaps supermen and superwomen. They would have had much greater intelligence and much greater knowledge than anyone who ever lived. Uh, physically, they would have been much more perfect. But the, uh, the preternatural gift of enlightenment which they enjoyed, which uh, being a particular creature of God, they had no right or claim or title to, would be enjoyed by the lower angels in a higher form. Uh, certainly, uh, if you read St. Augustine and other fathers of the church, in fact, St. Augustine says that the intellect of Adam, uh, he compared it to the flight of a bird compared to that of a tortoise. And most people today think that man has evolved to a higher state of consciousness, consciousness as they say, has gotten more intelligent as time has progressed, but just the opposite is true. Uh, St. Augustine and others say that actually the intellect of Adam was far, far superior than that of present-day man. Mm -hmm. But also, if you read that, what has happened, though, uh, to us? And in that third chapter of Genesis, God intended man to be in that state. And uh, <coughs> he committed what we call the sin, the, the original sin. It is the sin, uh, original sin, is really the sin of Adam. Most people think the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve, but more pre precisely, original sin is the sin of Adam because Adam was the head of the human race. It was his responsibility to obey God. Father, I have earlier interrupted you. <laughs> okay. I think uh, what's important to, realize, to consider is when we ask the question, why are people the way they are today? Why are there wars? Why do people hate? Why do they steal, and lie, and cheat? The story is given to us, the account is given to us in Holy Scripture. It is because of original sin. And uh, if you study original sin, if you study the account, you can see that when God placed our first parents there, He gave them a probation period. He promised them that if you obey me, uh, if you do not eat of the fruit in the, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, uh, he was saying to them, this is a test period. You show me your loyalty, you show me your obedience, and all of these gifts will be you, yours and all your posterity. So it was a test, and it was a test of love to see how much they loved him. I think it's important to point out, though, that this was not to be the ultimate destiny of Adam and Eve. They were not meant to simply obey God in not eating of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and remain in the Garden of Eden forever with just those preternatural gifts. God had destined them ultimately for the beatific vision. And some, at some time, if they had proven faithful to him, he would have taken them uh, into his presence so they would have seen him... Immediately. Uh, immediately, right. seen him face to face. 
why did Adam and Eve commit this sin? I mean, it just seems inconceivable mm -hmm. to someone would, if mm -hmm. they were blessed with so many gifts, mm -hmm. why they would do that. Well, if you study the accounts and you look at the diabolical <coughs> temptation of Satan, if you look at this account in Holy Scripture, the third chapter, and I think for a, a sound study of the psychology, for sake of lack of a better word, of temptation, there is no better account given than that in the third chapter of Genesis. Hmm. The serpent was more subtle uh, than any of the beasts of the earth. And Satan began with a why. Here they are, Adam and Eve, in the middle of the garden. And Satan says to Eve, why? Why hath God commanded you that you should not eat of every tree of paradise? And so Satan starts off with a why, as he does in all temptation. And he sows the seeds of doubt. And I'm sure for the audience out there, if you could stop and consider any temptation you have ever succumbed to, hasn't it always begun with a why? Hasn't the devil suggested to you, well, why should you not at liberty defy your conscience, commit horrible sin, sins of the flesh, disobey God? Why, have, why do you have to be restrained or constrained to some God-given law or man law? Be free. Defy your conscience. Who does God think he is? That's the devil speaking. So he begins with a why. <clears throat> and if you examine this account, there are three steps in the diabolical temptation. Satan aroused a doubt. God is holding something back on you, he's saying. He's saying to Eve and Adam, be more free. Defy your conscience. And the second thing that the devil is guilty of is that he removed the fear of, con the, of the consequences of sin. You know, Satan always ridicules punishment. He said in this account, in the third uh, Genesis, he says, you will not die. There is no hell. Yeah. <laughs> right. See, so Satan always contradicts God, and uh, he minimizes sin. <coughs> uh, he says to us in a crafty and subtle way in our fallen human nature, well, why should you not uh, go out and commit sins of the flesh? Why not go out, as they say, and get all you can? Enjoy life to its fullest. You have a right to be happy and do whatever you want to do. Who is anybody to tell you that you cannot commit these vices and excesses? Have you never been drunk? You never lived until you've gotten intoxicated. Go out and be free. And so he says in the third I think thing in the step of Satan was the false promise. He said to Eve, she says, uh, well, God says we can eat of all the fruits uh, in the of paradise except uh, that of the knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we did eat of that fruit, we would die. And the devil says, the false promise is, no, you will not die to death. What Satan was really saying was, uh, that God knows the difference between good and evil, but he doesn't want you, Adam and Eve, to know the difference because you, till, you too will be like him. He's a jealous God. <clears throat> He's afraid that you will be equal to him. Go ahead, Eve. Take that fruit. Go ahead. And then she saw it was pleasing to the eye. <clears throat> it's good to look at. And she took and did eat and gave it to her husband who did also take and eat. And then what happened? Their eyes were open. They perceived themselves to be naked, and they became ashamed. Well, you say, well, why uh, did they see themselves naked after the fall and not before the fall? I think it is because uh, being filled with sanctifying grace, a grace suffused through the body, maybe with a special aura of lights around them, and then after the fall, they lost sanctifying grace. It was destroyed. And then they perceived, perceived themselves to be naked. You know, this, uh, this is really something very profound because 
I think anyone who really is honest with themselves and asks them, I mean, they know when they've fallen, assuming they haven't assassinated their conscience. Usually these forbidden things are presented to us as being very delectable, and we will be so happy if we can have them. And the, one, the moment we actually do something which is, is wrong, we see that they're not so delectable after all, that it was a lie. It's nothing. Well, it is a lie, and uh, it's really the age of the big lie. They say one of the one of the biggest aspects of the big lie is uh, the idea that we're here to enjoy ourselves. The idea that we must find our fulfillment and our happiness in this life, complete and uh, total. Um, this is an idea that is spread by those who don't believe in the immortality of the soul. Uh, the worst of it is where religion is used to say that God wants us to find our ultimate happiness in this life. Do you remember what Our Lady said to Lord Bernadette in, at Lourdes? Our Lady said to her, I cannot promise you happiness in this life, but only in the next. This is the message of all true religion. This is the message of Christianity, of Catholicism, that we are created in the image and likeness of God to see God, and He will be our ultimate happiness. St. Alphonsus Liguori says that when a man dies, he will immediately understand, for the first time perhaps, that only in God can he find his happiness. And those who are trying to seek it here in this life are looking, are on a wild goose chase because they, they are here to serve and not to be served, just as the Son of God came into the world to be served, came into the world to serve and not to be served. You know, it, it seems that uh, our society completely in a practical way, does not believe or acknowledge the consequences or the existence of original sin. We often find this in the very liberal attitude towards, say, censorship. Uh, some very obscene ads or, or programs may be aired and uh, people would say, well, you know, they have a right to show that. You can't restrain him. And then you might point out that perhaps uh, there's some evil consequences. Then they'll say, well, no one is forcing you to watch this. No one's forcing you to watch this. I mean, this is, they, they don't understand the effect of the original sin. Could you perhaps explain this, this, this tendency we have toward that which is evil? Well, due to original sin, uh, the flesh rebels against the dictates of right reason. Uh, when Adam sinned, and I say Adam because he was responsible, he was the representative of the human race. When he, and actually original sin was actually the sin of pride uh, made manifest through an act of disobedience to God. And when he had sinned, when he had disobeyed God because of his pride, he noticed in himself the flesh rebelling against the dictates of right reason. He noticed himself rebelling against the will of God. That was one of the consequences of original sin. That is where the animal appetites in man, we have no control over. Uh, we have or, or only diplomatic, the will has yeah. diplomatic control over the passions. Yeah. But you know, our Lord has overturned this. Each one of us was born into the world with original sin in his soul. That is a sentence of condemnation against us, against our race. But by the virtue of Christ's death and the grace communicated to us through baptism, that sentence of condemnation is lifted, and we have a part with Christ in eternal life. And we are all born in the state of original sin, save one, the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, who is immaculately uh, conceived and immaculate conception by the means, the, you know, in view of the future merits, anticipated merits of her eternal Son, Jesus Christ, she was preserved free from the stain of original sin. You've been watching what...